All right, awesome. Uh, thanks everybody for coming today. Uh, my name is Jerry. I'm a software engineer here at Red Hat. I've been around for uh, somewhere between six to eight years, uh, depending on how you count. Uh, with me today is my great teammate, Ines. Hi everyone, my name is Ines. I'm the intern on the, on the MCO team we're going to introduce. And I started last May, so I'm doing a 16th month internship with Red Hat. It's an amazing experience and it's ending soon. So I'm here to share what I discovered in the 16th month. Awesome. And today we'll talk to you a little bit about your hybrid cloud operating system experience, the journeys we took, how we sort of got here as OpenShift. Um, and so basically what we'll be covering is sort of like the, the problem space first, right? Like what it means for large scale Linux operating systems. We're going to talk a little bit about the history and the challenges that we here at OpenShift have faced, as well as some other stories across like different uh, cloud providers. Um, we'll talk about like the challenges we face and how we want to sort of leverage image base as our sort of future solution to a lot of these problems. Uh, but before we get there, you know, let me define what that problem space looks like. Um, so, um, I assume most people here, as we are in the Kyber Cloud room, are somewhat familiar with the idea of containers at the very least, right? But um, the way I like to describe it, especially for someone who may be, you know, a little less familiar with the space, is like, the, the old problem space looks something like this, right? Um, as Jen sure highlighted, you know, you wrote something on your laptop, you try to deploy it to a company server, it runs a completely different hardware, completely different architecture, and it just doesn't work, right? You don't know why. Um, and sort of the way we envisioned as a solution to that was containers, um, which um, is an abstraction of the operating system that sort of bundled everything together, right? All the dependencies, all the sort of uh, application build and all that stuff, all into one um, unit that you can kind of deploy easily across different environments, right? And if you really think about it like deeper, you really just kind of push the problem to somebody else. Right? You as the application developer now have a much easier job with your life, right? Okay, you write containers. They're very easily distributable. They're very easy to build. They're very easy to push to a registry and pull to another laptop or a company server. Uh, but have you really considered that what makes that magic happen is that like, at the lower level, everything was set up such that, like, that these different environments, these different sort of types of hardware at the end of the day, was able to run the dependencies that allowed that container to run in the first place. And sort of that's where the problem space that we want to try to describe to you today is, right? It's like how in different in environments these operating systems are able to sort of run and act as that bridge between your hardware and your application. Because at the end of the day, that's what most application developers really care about, right? That their application is able to run. Um, for, for a lot of them, maybe you don't really care about the operating system, but hopefully you know, this will give you a little bit of insight. Um, yeah, and I sort of already went through this, right? Like, not only is the sort of having that operating system in place a thing, right? It's also the problem of being able to scale that, right? When you have like a single laptop, it's really easy to manage, right? You can run, you know, DNF upgrade, and most of the time, Fedora does that for you seamlessly. But when you have so many different machines, right? Like, and you want to keep all of them relatively updated um, and vulnerability free, that becomes much more of a hassle. So here, let me sort of highlight how we here at OpenShift took that journey. Um, and I've never been to the Sistine Chapel, but I've been told it depicts a picture of the great minds here at Red Hat uh, discovering OpenShift or creating it thereof. Um, I was going to put a picture of Brenton over there, but uh, he's not in the audience today. I don't want to get sued. So. Uh, so this is what OpenShift 2 used to look like. If you've never seen like the old, old original OpenShift, um, this is ripped off of a web archive somewhere. Um, the Panda actually still exists for OKD purposes, but the OpenShift logo has long changed. And the old OpenShift logo, you can maybe see on the top uh, left over there is like this little, actually I don't know what that was. Um, but it, it, it was actually already based on containers back in 2011, 2012. It was just based on sort of very early LXC concepts and use something I think called gears and cartridges, which was an OpenShift specific thing. Uh, but um, you know, that's just a little bit too far for what we want to talk about. So we'll start with OpenShift 3, which is when we made, uh, we here at Red Hat, made the switch to Kubernetes as sort of the, found and containers as sort of the foundational uh, pieces to build our platform. Um, and uh, I can't talk about OpenShift 3 without having to talk a little bit about Ansible. And if you've never talked about, if you've never heard about Ansible, 
Uh, think of it as a really, really fancy bash script. And don't tell the Ansible team I said that. So uh, it's a way for you to sort of configure your application deployment orchestration and like any many other processes uh, via these like really uh, cool looking like playbooks where you can sort of define what you want the system to be and what we want the system to do and it'll run through that for you. And in, back in OpenShift 3, you know, this is what we use to configure most of that process to get your cluster going, right? And back in OpenShift 3, when you know, OpenShift is a you know, distributed sort of computing um, container engine um, slash platform, is that you had sort of your own choice, right? You can bring your own operating system. And uh, most of the time, of course, uh, it really was meant to do one of the two. If you were sort of more traditional, you had the good old Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, 7 back in the day. Um, and if you were a little more adventurous and you wanted to sort of get to the cutting edge, we had Red Hat Atomic, uh, which is actually where I started working. Um, and that was sort of a, like an operating system more tailored for container operations. Uh, but a lot of the concepts were very new and a lot, some, many customers were not as familiar with using some of the tooling behind it. Um, but regardless of which one you used, and I ripped this sort of off the OpenShift 3 install guide, is like you had to do all that steps to set up your operating system um, yourself, right? Normally via the Ansible playbook I talked about, but um, so you had to set up this you know, storage, your SE Linux stuff, all your networking stuff. You had to register all your hosts just to get the packages such as Kubelet to get your thing starting to run, right? So you had to go, <clears throat> excuse me, all these steps, and when you wanted to do an upgrade, you basically had to run through everything again, and you had to like individually go into each individual node, make sure the packages were updated. Trains. Again, you know, it's not as manual since we had you know, Ansible to sort of back this up, uh, but at the end of the day, you were sort of uh, manually doing all of this by hand, right? And, you know, again, we push all the work to the system admins, essentially, right? And um, it's, you know, all of that process was a lot of work. And the other big problem here is that because there were so many different combinations of platform to operating system to hardware, it was impossible for us to sort of test and verify that every single combination worked every single one of the time. Which means that if you, as a community user using Fedora Core, or sorry, Fedora Atomic Close, or if you were an enterprise customer using our RHEL variants, it, it really, we, we really couldn't help you sometimes because the error you ran into, we've never seen in our life. Um, and you know, we had to do our best to try to make that, bridge that gap. Um, and so we were like, hmm, that's a very big pain point. And as engineers, we're here to help you with your pain points, right? And so we went from that to our second generation of how we wanted to envision operating system management, which is what I like to call you know, generation two. Um, and generation two really happened when sort of Red Hat acquired CoreOS. Now, if you don't know CoreOS, they were sort of a big pioneer in a lot of the um, like installation and management of um, Kubernetes level uh, objects, right? Including like the operator framework, um, including CoreOS, the operating system, uh, they sort of um, had a whole chain of how they did their management that we thought, well, wow, like, why couldn't we do this as well? Uh, so you know, we acquired CoreOS to help us uh, do this. And the idea here really is that we wanted to make it such that your operating system was now managed and life cycled together with the cluster. In a perfect world, that just meant you don't have a system admin anymore, right? You just have a Kubernetes admin. And the operating system is just an extension of the Kubernetes system. And this is sort of the architecture. Now, if you were at my um, you know, operator development talk yesterday with Zach in the audience, uh, and if you haven't, you should definitely check it out. Uh, this is sort of the same architecture diagram I ripped off of there. Uh, it's sort of a simplified version again, but, but now, you know, instead of having you, a human, have to operate on each individual node and make sure that all of them is up to date, you as the admin only interact with the kube API on the top left. That's it. Like everything else is a bunch of pods essentially running on these ho hosts, making sure that everything else is up to date. And so like two of the big things I like to highlight off of this is like you no longer had to think of your nodes as individuals, right? You no longer had to worry about whether that, you know, one AWS instance that always has a memory leak will memory leak again, right? It, it'll be a pool of resources instead. Right? There'll be a homogenous set of computing resources for you to manage together and for you to use as a set of resources. And you declaratively manage these things via something we call machine configs, uh, which kind of looks like this. Um, it's 
it's just another Kubernetes uh, custom resource definition, essentially. But you know, you no longer had to go into your host and run like DNF or you use your Ansible to wrap around that. You just sort of tell the node that, hey, I want these packages. Hey, I want to set up this systemd unit declaratively. And the uh, OpenShift platform in this case, uh, via its Kubernetes extensions, would do all that for you. Uh, but that wasn't without its problems. Um, the customizations that we had were very restrictive, right? And you know, I, I kind of lied to you about the fact that you no longer need a system admin because you still need that system admin. They just had to learn a new way to do things, right? Um, we, uh, we we wrote this whole new like idea, and everybody was like, "Oh, but do we have to do this? Can we just use the good old regular rel and Ansible, which we've bought from Red Hat and used for the last ten years?" You know, and like uh, because of like a lot of like design constraints earlier on, it actually so it leverages a lot of the RPM OS tree functionality and stuff like that under the hood. But it was sort of doing it in a hybrid way where it arbitrarily decides that some things should be manual and some things shouldn't, right? And in this case, that just sort of introduced a lot of more error modes and made recovery and stuff like that harder. Um, so, you know, we, we got thinking, right? Um, you know, why are we doing it the way we're doing this when RPM OS tree and um, a lot of other tooling within the space has this problem solved already? You know, why are we writing files manually to hand? Right. Can we make that sort of transactional instead? Can we have atomic updates? Um, can we build the operating system in a different fashion? Um, I mean, I'm sort of already spoiling it, and you've definitely listened to Boot C at least like, you know, 15 times in the past few days. But the idea here is like, you know, what if we could make that operating system experience take one step further, and then you know, make it image-based instead, um, just like you know how we want to do with RHEL. And that sort of concludes my section. And I hope you're not here for the history because that's not the exciting part. What I want to highlight is what we want to do in the future. And there's no per better person to do it than Ines. Thank you. Thanks, Sherry. So what's next? I think, um, yeah, please remember the last slide because uh, what's coming next is to solve the ones that on the previous slide. And if you don't, okay, pick. Okay, time up. Okay, so what I'm going to discuss is, uh, I won't call it like a third generation on your OS configuration journey, and we'll be introducing optimizing your OS configuration with a hybrid image-based approaches. And here I highlight the word image-based here, and uh, yeah, I'm going to just, we'll, we'll, uh, get to start with an overview, what does it mean, why I'm highlighting it out, and what what is the change we made from the past? And after we get like a basic understanding and we are on the same page for just understanding what this approach is, and we'll, we'll, I will do a deeper dive into the implementation and design details architecture-wise, how we um, make it into a realistic thing uh, in the second half. And last but not least, there still remain some gaps and limitations that prevent us to adapt a fully image-based approach. Let's get started. So as promised, at the overview. Um, here's like a graph on the left side of the screen, and I don't expect you, or actually I do not want you to read it now and memorize everything. I, I just wanted you to have like a vague picture of this whole graph in mind, so that in the end you will naturally pick it up, because we are going component by component together. No photo here, no big memories, like, memories, like, memorization, okay, I'm kidding, yeah. Go ahead. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I wanted you to have those components pieces by pieces together, and by the end of this presentation, you will naturally come up with this graph together with us. So what has changed? And it's meaningless to talk about what has changed if we do not talk about um, what we used to have and what it is right now. And also by saying like image based, I think most of our audience here are familiar with this concept and maybe ask like, um, I feel it's not a new thing. My system is image based, Quora's is Im uh, image based. It used layering things like three years ago from an enhancement and uh, when I'm like trying to do an OS Im uh, image update on my nose or when I'm trying to do um, OpenShift like update, I still pull the new images down. So uh, what is new over there? But for uh, the day two configuration machine um, config operator is doing, I would say, is it image based? Yes and no. We do like a both. So if, for example, you have a user, you want to specify your OS image URL, uh, you input that through machine config, and that is image based. Um, what machine config oper operator will do is we will call RPM to rebase and reboot your node um, into that image. 
However, for example, if you want to do a direct file writing into your system or reconfigure your SSH keys, what a machine config operator will do is actually by manual file writings. What we'll do is um, make a directory into your um, node and then write the files directly into that. So you can see it's kind of like a hybrid mode and there's like a gap in the middle. And this sometimes, it's most of the times working, but sometimes a little bit problematic because it so it's like there are several sources of truth for what the, con uh, sorry, what the config should look like. There's the image, there's the manual file writings by the machine config operator. There's also, for example, if a use your user or system main, you can turn into your node and make a change yourself. And um, it results in us a lot of the bugs we see, like people are complaining, oh, why is there just, I made a little update, I made a little change, but my nodes are all degraded, what happens? Actually, this is due to a config drift, because when uh, you close a node and machine config operator take, the, take back the control, it'll see there's a difference between um, what it should like look like according to the machine config and it will actually looks like because of the change you made. And this becomes a problematic, and we'll, that's why we're introducing what will be in the future, which is a fully image-based model. And in future, what we'll have on the node is a raw boosty layer, a coarse layer, an OCP node layer, and an MCO day to config layer. And please notice here that by saying layer, I'm not uh, pointing to a single like image, but this layer can have multiple ones, and there's a sequence that you can roll back to, or like um, it's in the future you want to roll out to, and looking, spanning, or like inspecting through that. And all the manual rights have followed that arrow, and that will be built into an image and roll out onto a node. And the details of that, um, we will discuss that a little bit later. And uh, another change we made is also where um, is your image being built and stored. Originally, for, for example, here for the core space image, what we're currently doing is we're pulling pre-built images from the registry. But now, with the will be, like what we're doing right now, is for all your configs, you are lively applied to your uh, cluster, we'll also lively build this image on your cluster, on cluster build. And uh, uh, by doing so, it is a lively one, and uh, whenever you um, introduce a new machine config, it will be built in an image, and it will go directly on, onto your um, node on the spot. So here, um, there are a little recap on the motivation on a lot of the problem solved. So by giving up this local disk writing and adopting an image-based update path, we can achieve that the layered OS image will become the source of truth for configuration that nodes are, uh, are booted to, roll back to, and apply with. This will efficiently prevent nodes from degrading due to config drift. And also, we keep changes into separate layers, we also make image inspection, testing, and scanning easier. After we have like um, on the same page about how uh, this will look like and what's the motivations, why we're doing that, next um, I will go uh, deep dive into how it looks like and this graph shows up again, so plenty of time that we all play around with it. So this time we'll focus on the red circle part on that corner and uh, let's get started. So on this journey, no matter you're a developer and you wanted to solve the same architecture challenges machine config oper operator is currently uh, focusing on, or if, for example, you have a system domain and your main interaction with a whole cluster is that uh, you have a bunch of um, inputs and uh, boom, the magic just happened and you have a, like an image rolled out to your nose and you are just wondering what's the, like happening under the hood. You are the right place and we are going to unbox like this black box together. Now it's still a mystery box. And the only thing we have over here is the user input via machine config and then a fully deployed no uh, image onto your nodes. What happens inside? So the, sorry. <clears throat> so the first destination of your user input is two user-facing APIs, the machine OS build and machine OS config. And on that side of the screen, um, I have a, like a visual, but a much simplified one of the architecture of these two APIs. And uh, by just uh, a quickly look through um, what's the, like, the blocks over there, you might meet, uh, notice some uh, functionality differences between uh, the two of them. So for example, for the machine OS config API, it's more focused on the inputs, the build inputs you want to do and the customization you want to do. For example, there's machine config pool, so it's uh, specified the, uh, the pool of the nodes that you want the changes to be applied to. Or for example, the base OS image, which will be rolled into your node, and the but, um, but uh, 
the machine OS build will focus more on the build st status and the build um, outputs. So for example, uh, there's the image push back to stored images or desired config, uh, meaning that uh, what will be built into the image. And these two APIs working together for retrieving user inputs and managing configuration and build related objects. It allow users to input customized OS configuration in a less error prone way and also sets a single uh, source of truth. Um, you notice that I really like this word, uh, to track current versus design configurations, image build processes, and image in update queue. So after we store all our build inputs into the API objects, those are input into the machine OS builder, and we trigger the on cluster image build process. A little recall, um, this is the, the, the key part. So let's get started. What, um, so, um, uh, and as we said, um, all our build inputs and your customizations are stored into the machine OS config. So, uh, who will post that? That is the machine OS builder. So, it will uh, retrieve all the inputs you put and then do, do the look into that. Is there an update change? Uh, is there an update? Is there a change? Should I trigger a build onto that? And the answer is yes. It will initiate the image build by making a build request and form a build out image builder pod. And uh, another thing that uh, we are frequently doing is that the image build pod will um, start in the build, but no one knows what's going on. So I'll sync its status frequently and put that into the machine OS build objects. Is this build pending? Is it still running? Is this, um, did you some reason interrupted, failed? Or if it's successful, like the user will no want to know like immediately. So those of the status are synced to the machine OS build. And due to their our Kubernetes APIs, the user can easily get to see what's stored in there. Am I Input correct, what's the status of that? And the most importantly, the output is also stored into that and get pushed to an image registry. So um, after we building the image, it will be stored into the current registry, and this is the last step, image rolling out, which actually is the simplest part. So we'll fetch the built image from the container image registry specified by the user and Kaboos switch to target the built image reference to boot, like over here. And now, by this time, we complete this magic and pump out this graph by putting three pieces together. So I did a little recap here. Uh, after you input things through machine OS config and machine OS build, those will first come to um, on cluster image build and then do a build uh, based on what you input. And then it goes, uh, after the image is being built, it goes to image rolling out to pull out the image and roll that onto your node. So this forms on cluster layering, which is the main feature uh, um, the machine configure operator is currently implementing and will be promoted to the def default update path in the future. And thanks to Zach over here, which is uh, the main architecture over there. Give some applause. So on cluster layering is a seamlessly image-based configuration flow by building and deploying OCI images on the cluster integrating data from multiple resources. Uh, the three design details are over there. Okay, so um, we've been through the, 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 the bottom part, but uh, you may ask, uh, I feel there's other parts on, 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 the, on this image. Uh, have you mentioned about those and uh, did you forget about that? Actually, I did not. Up there is what to expect next and also is the gaps and limitations we currently have. So uh, for all the, uh, among all the updates, there are certain updates that uh, we cannot or do not or um, cannot currently do in the image-based way. And I classify them into three categories and I will go um, deeper into that. So the first category is we cannot make them into um, image-based. So for example, SH keys, currently we do not um, support that, uh, sorry, the SH keys writing to the core user but currently only on the real user. And there are also updates that we actually do not want to build into the image. For example, there are certain updates that are reboot list we promised, and it's on our GitHub page, be, be right to check that. But also there are also uh, some of the updates uh, defined by uh, node disruptions policies that specifically requires less of a reboot. However, if you build them into an image, the last step is to rolling out to reboot your uh, node into the image. We can that does not guarantee that anymore. And the last of bet, uh, for example, the KR over there is that we currently cannot build into the image due to some, uh, we are still working on BC and working on our site, but in future, we'll be figuring out a post and store KR changing st stories. And that's everything about the image base part. Hope you enjoy this journey. And I'll pass it back to Jerry to talk about the hosted architecture. Thanks, Ines. That was a really great and descriptive uh, overview. Hopefully, most of us still sort of remember the architecture. But if not, we'll go back to the 
uh, one of the images, right? But notice that, like, so far, what we all talked about is, like, your traditional, what we like to call a standalone cluster, right? It's like you have your control plane um, as individual hosts, you have your worker nodes as individual hosts. And really what a lot of like sort of the popular distributions you see out there like you know um, EKS and stuff like that, uh, most of them sort of run under a hosted architecture, right? And if we go back to the original idea of you, know, you as a developer have an application and you just want the application to run and you don't really care about like all that layers that come in between, now, the hosted architecture is both something that like works really well for you as well as something that's just like generally like I think like image-based approaches is like a good sort of um, a fit for it because um, in the hosted um, like architecture that we talk about, right, you have your, uh, you have a sort of a central management cluster generally speaking that runs like the control plane for all the other uh, clusters. So each individual small hosted cluster, you know, generally only has workers, right, and that's, uh, what you as an application developer or like as an application admin will be interfacing with. And you, you know, you can have one big management cluster that can essentially host like hundreds of control planes for other things and that's all they will be doing, right? Their workloads are just the uh, API for everything else. And we can extend that sort of to have that sort of build and registry functionality to sort of act as that, right? And so now you have a central management cluster it does your image builds, it hosts its registry, and every and you can have like hundreds of individual clusters, whether they be like geographically located or for like different like hardware and architecture purposes. You know, the, the image-based approach really works well for this, right? Um, and another thing I sort of want to highlight is um, since I did mention like other sort of major cloud providers and what they do with um, operating systems is like a lot of things that we want to do with operating systems, a lot of the things that we do today via the CoreOS model and a lot of things that we want to do in the future via Bootsy and other like image-based approaches, this is all really like new and exciting, right? Like if you like look up documentation, for example, if you self-host a Kubernetes cluster on AWS, um, basically, you, you know, to update your n machines, you essentially do a destroy and recreate, right? You uh, set up your machine deployment to have a rolling upgrade. You basically provide your own new AMI, AMI. Um, and then uh, the cluster will sort of take care of that for you. But at the end of the day, you're still sort of responsible for your own operating system. And I really think that like having us be able to make that happen via a container file and roll that across like a whole variety of different hosted clusters from a centrally managed perspective is really something that a lot of users will get a lot of leverage out of. And so yeah, so that's sort of our story and for you today, right? We like to make your experiences better, both as an application developer and as a system admin, right? For the application developer, we want to make sure that you know everything um, works the same way across like different types of clouds. For the system admin, we want to make it easier for you to provision, to build, to upgrade, to uh, you know auto scale your clusters via these container images that we talked about. And also from the image-based story we're telling, we also want to share a takeaway that sometimes the best way to solve a problem is to break the current mind model. For example, from the machine config operator, we don't want to do manual writings anymore. We want to do, uh, convert it to a fully image-based and build a solution right from the root problem. We love containers. We'll build everything in containers. That's everything. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? So thank you for the great insights. Uh, but from upgrading perspective, I always click buttons, right? Uh, I'm not going to say any of these things. What I would like, or you know, what I would like to share is uh, an assurance if I do the same thing on stage and it worked, I sometimes get worried if I do the same thing on production, will it work? How do we have some assurances like, you know, or deep insights, what's going to happen so that I can compare? I, when the stage I upgraded, these are the steps it took, it did all the logs, and the same thing is going to happen in production. That, that's what worries me a little bit more. Can you address that? Thanks, and I can start um, answering that. Uh, so, okay, I'm, not, I'm gonna be completely honest with you. I think there will be no world where we can ever say 
that if it works in one environment, it will 100% guaranteed works in the other or you, know, you get all your money back, right? Um, you know, there's a lot of nuances to software that we can't cover. However, with that said, like a lot of the things we want to do with the container-based approaches is to sort of give you that ability to have more confidence in that workflow by being able to pre-build that and to deploy that in different environments to test and to production in the exact same way. So in the old way of doing things, right, you'd write a machine config or you'd like stage a new OpenShift payload. It would come with a bunch of new templates, everything would get rendered. And then depending on your local environment, maybe something changed in the meantime, right, um, between your production and your non-production cluster. Or even sometimes there's just like a network time. Like, we're not resilient to things like that. We get into a halfway stuck state. And then we, like you said, like in production, you know, it, it worked on our test environment, and then in production everything stalls. And then it becomes a severity one issue, and then everybody is like panicking, right? But with container-based approaches, for one, everything is transactional, right? So we never want you to get into that half-baked state again where you're half through everything and nothing works, right? And obviously there will still be failures, and we'll, oh, and we'll still try to roll you back, uh, but at least you'll still have a functional node at the end of the day, right? And the other half of that is like, you can, in the worst case scenario that something goes wrong, now you can say, okay, I have this container file with my operating system. I can push it to a registry somewhere, and you here at Red Hat, pull it locally and tell me what's going on here, right? So we hope that like all of these functionality that we want to add to this like workflow will make your life easier in that sense. Uh, do you have anything to add, Ines? Oh, I was searching for a slide. I think I. Uh I agree with that, and maybe I agree with you what you said, and maybe uh, some extensions on this keeping changes um, can make this inspection testing scanning easier. There's also other use cases, as Jerry said. For example, uh, if you are like a support engineer and you wanna like inspect, um, uh, like my node is degraded, what's running wrong? You can inspect uh, what has to like happen in the middle, and then you can uh, directly pull the images from uh, what the customers are rolling out to and inspect from there. And if, for example, you've um, built your image and before rolling that. Uh, like the on cost layering like a uh, process currently is um, like uh, a seamlessly and you uh, after you build you immediately pull but there's also as Jerry said we can add uh, like a stop point in the middle and there are several like you can do pre-build for example save it somewhere and before you're rolling out make sure you're 100% conf uh, confident with that and this is up to your choice and we are providing this choice to you instead of like you are uh, do the writings and uh, realize it's wrong after you've already done it and uh, that will uh, efficiently prevent a lot of degradations we have right now and uh, make sure that uh, everything is more smoothly and uh, you have like a working cluster in your nodes uh, for a longer period of time. Thank you. I think we have time for maybe one more question. Oh, we're out of time actually. All right. Well, we'll be around. Thank you. Um, you know, thanks for coming to our talk once again. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone. And now do stick around because Dan's up next.